Joseph Calista and I are doing a movie called Nine Days to Change the World, which is uh, Pope John Paul II in Poland in 1979. And one of the people in the movie, that was a very young person back then, said, you know, every third Pole saw the Pope physically, was, was in his presence in nine days. The crowds were enormous. And this guy said, we're standing in Warsaw, and there were millions of people. And we look around and we suddenly realize, there are more of us than there are of the government. Why are we afraid of that? He said, from that time on, it never changed. There was a constant struggle for 10 years. Because people get up every day and say, this is the point about the cross in the desert. If you ask the average American, do you think it's okay, compatible with freedom, to have a VFW cross in the middle of the Mojave Desert? I'll bet you it's a 90 to 5. And the 5 are winning. Well, that's not democracy. That's not. And this is why Lincoln's phrase, uh, which I was told one day he said in a very distinct way, government of the people Government by the people. Government for the people. And Lincoln was making a point at Gettysburg. Well, the people would not take down the Mojave Cross. The people wouldn't have the corrupt deals in, in, in Washington. And the people wouldn't have the corrupt deals in Sacramento. The question is, how do you communicate this? What we're doing is beginning to learn, as we did last year on, on a Drill Here, Drill Now, Pay Less. We're beginning to learn how to work with the people to overthrow the machine. One more question, and then I'll shut up so other people can ask. Um, yeah, I um, you, you mentioned the competition, economic competition with China and India. Mm -hmm. I think there's a global warming situation, um, the Copenhagen uh, fiasco, yes. um, the uh, insistence that we handicap ourselves right. and subsidize them um, goes directly to that issue. Can you, can you talk about sure. the wisdom or lack of Look, it on that? If you are a hard left activist, then your goal, whether it's in national security or economy or environment, is to cripple America first. And that's your goal. I mean, you, your goal is to say, since America is an imperialist, racist country which has exploited the planet, what can we do to cripple America? And you look at the Kyoto Treaty, which the, Congress, which the Senate repudiated 99 to 0. Right. And because Al Gore negotiated the Kyoto Treaty that was fundamentally anti-American. Copenhagen was, fun, it was, was embarrassingly anti-American. And this administration, I think, if the, if the elite media had covered Copenhagen accurately, Obama would never have recovered from the depth of the humiliation. Because the fact is, at one point, you had China, Brazil, India, and South Africa actively negotiating around Obama and lying to the White House about their meetings. Now, that, that's what he's done to replace George W. Bush. He's really brought us back to a point where you know, they might not have liked Bush, but they feared him enough they would never have done that. Content, newsroom? Do you have a question? I'm good. I, I have a question. Jobs, jobs, jobs. So um, are you taking this mantra from President Obama, or you have suggested that that's the first thing that politicians should work on today? You know, I published a book called Real Change that came out just before he adopted change, you can believe him. He stole that line from you. Right, <laughs> I know, he didn't steal it. He didn't steal it from me. It was just obvious that that's where the country was at that point. Uh, the president has lots of words, almost none of which have meaning. Okay. I mean, it's just, I, I find it hard to read his speeches. Because I know that they are, they are patently so, there's such a huge gap between what he says and what he's doing. We can't afford to spend, he says, as he announces, a, you know, a gigantic increase in, in domestic discretionary spending has gone up $1.4 trillion a year since Pelosi and Reid took over. And then that's just a straight face and say, you know, we can't really afford to spend all that. Um, you know, he's really for openness. He's really sorry that they, he said, he said two days ago, he was really sorry that they didn't keep their word about having open meetings. And maybe it was a mistake not to have kept his word because after all, he did give his word. Well, that's easy. So is he going to open the next set of meetings? Is there a meeting this afternoon he'd like to open? I mean, he could have his meetings with Pelosi and Reid on C-SPAN. I mean, he can't do it. He can't functionally do it. But there's just, I don't find any... And, you know, he's for jobs, except, by the way, he wants to tax everybody who creates jobs. What are you going to do to create jobs? Well, the first thing we do, frankly, is, is reduce taxes. Let me, let me draw a distinction between long-term and short-term. It's very important. You know, we may get some short-term bounce because, on a worldwide basis, central banks have put $30 trillion into the system. And so it's fairly hard not to imagine you get some level of deflation. It's like watching an athlete take steroids. I mean, there's... 
there's a point here where the sheer volume of paper money is going to have some short-term impact. In the long term, we're not getting the kind of change we need. So in the long run, you've actually got to reform seven systems. If you want to compete with China and India, you have to reform litigation, regulation, taxation, education, health, energy, and infrastructure, which is why American Solutions is designed. These are really large changes. These are not small changes. In the short run, our proposal is uh, to dramatically control spending, uh, starting with the stimulus package, TARP money, uh, the sale of everything the government's acquired in the last two years. I mean, the government shouldn't keep any General Motors stock. The government shouldn't. I don't want the United States government involved in the private sector. And in fact, I'd like to see us start figuring out how we're going to unwind Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, because they're inherently dangerous. And people seem to have learned nothing about why these systems were so dangerous over the last few years. And my argument is, in part, Californians will understand this because they live so We've had three bubbles so far, IT in 1999, housing in 2007, Wall Street in 2008. The fourth bubble is government. And so you've got to start unwinding spending. So I would, I would say, rather than say, let's freeze, you know, this, all this, again, to give you an example of words, we're going to freeze spending for some categories where it is right now. Okay. It's like my daughter's calling home after their freshman year and saying, I charged $50,000 on my credit card, but I want to guarantee you that the next three years I won't charge more than $50,000. You know, if he's serious about controlling spending, why doesn't he take as the baseline the last House Republican budget for FY 2007 and say, gosh, we've added this much spending since, since you know, they're only talking about three years ago. So why, why do you think we need this volume of additional spending over three years ago? And now you have a different thing. We, we would take the money saved, and we would do the following things. One, we'd have a 50% reduction in the Social Security and Medicare tax, both for the worker and for the company, so that you'd have a huge increase in cash flow for small businesses, and you'd lower their requirement for bank loans, and you would enable every working American to have an increase in take-home pay. We would do that for two years, during which time there would be an entitlement reform project, and people would then be aware of how much taxes were on the table, and you'd have a very different conversation about entitlement reform. Two, we would uh, go to 100% expensing for small business investment so American small businesses could have the best machinery and the best equipment in the world. Three, in order to match China in job creation, we would match the Chinese in capital gains tax, which is zero. The Chinese have no capital gains tax. And money would flow into the United States if you had zero capital gains. Uh, four, we would match the Irish on corporate tax rates, which is 12.5% and our companies would become the most aggressive in the world. Uh, and I'm going to come back to that in a second. And five, we would abolish the death tax permanently because it's both morally wrong and economically irrational. Now, let me go back to the corporate tax. The President announced yesterday a bold new initiative to increase exports overseas. You have zero capital gains and a 12.5% corporate rate. You don't need a government program to increase exports. We will be the dominant exporting country in the world. We have a bigger industrial base than China. Which we're still the largest manufacturing company in the country in the world. What about China keeping its currency artificially large? You cut taxes at this scale. The if the Chinese are determined to bankrupt themselves by shipping things overseas for less than their true cost, that's fine. We, 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 with the tax code I just described to you, if you tossed in litigation reform on top of that and you tossed in regulatory reform on top of that, I don't care what the Chinese currency is like. They couldn't compete with us. But again, you've got the people who benefit from and control that system, that taxation system, who are going to be the ones asked to make this kind of reform. I'm asking, I'm doing what Reagan did. I'm asking the American people to decide, if you can't communicate with these guys, fire them. And if you can't fire them in a general election, fire them in a primary. So if they're in a gerrymandered Democratic seat, run someone in the Democratic primary. I think you're talking a little too easy on the American American people, as a large group of people, tend to be schizophrenic about what they want from their government. At the very general level, they are kind of in sync with the founders, small government, uh, you know, limited government, classical liberal ideals, such and such. But when it comes to uh, their representatives in Washington and in Sacramento, they want goodies brought home to them, and they will elect them on the basis of that. And that kind of contradict that's a self-contradictory political outlook, in my view. And unless you educate them that this is deadly and ultimately will bankrupt the entire system, and they really know that, so that when they want that stuff from Washington, they realize 
They're wanting something that ultimately 